Hi, my name is Eitan, and my goal with this presentation is to give you some intuition on how your choice of analysis tool affects the optimized design for aerodynamic shape optimization. Historically, engineering design has been done through a manual iterative process involving some sort of analysis, whether it's computational or experimental, and the design changes are driven by engineering intuition. As computational tools are becoming more prevalent, experimental testing has been replaced, and this allows for engineers to rapidly iterate on designs using best principles. That iteration looks something like this. The engineer proposes a design and runs the design through the analysis tool. The analysis tool returns a flow field and scalar performance metrics, such as lift and drag. The engineer, using this information and design intuition, tries to improve the design by changing the shape. This process allows the engineer to include constraints that may be hard to formalize. For example, they know the airfoil has to perform well at a range of angles of attack, so they use a rounded leading edge. Optimization aims to automate this process by replacing the human in the loop with a numerical optimizer. Instead of the flow field and lift and drag, the optimizer uses only scalar performance metrics, and in the case of gradient-based optimization, the derivatives of those metrics with respect to the design changes. The optimizer uses only these scalar performance metrics to guide the changes to the design. There's no engineering intuition or best principles involved. Often, it'll try to make unrealistic shapes. For example, airfoil is with a very sharp leading edge. Aerodynamic shape optimization was initially used by experts who had a thorough understanding of both the CFD and optimization codes. Recently, commercial CFD tools have been adding aerodynamic shape optimization capabilities, which allow new users, such as students and more junior engineers, to get their hands on aerodynamic shape optimization tools. As much as we'd like it to be, optimization isn't magic, it still needs human input. In practice, there's an outer loop around the optimization loop where the engineer looks at the optimized design and updates the optimization problem or the underlying model used by the optimizer to try to improve the final result. This requires engineering intuition but a slightly different kind than was used in the past. The only information that the optimizer has access to is whatever the CFD code uses to compute the scalar performance metrics. This raises the risk that if you pick the wrong analysis method that doesn't include all the necessary physics, you might end up with an optimized design that's not actually an improvement. This raises the question, what happens if you pick the wrong model, the wrong CFD code? If you don't include all the physics, what will happen to the optimized design? We're going to investigate that question using airfoil optimization. I'll start by introducing the two analysis methods, the two CFT solvers, that we use in this work. The first is a RAN solver, it's our in-house CFT code called 80flow, which is a parallel finite volume solver. It uses a spalart Almaris turbulence model and discrete adjoint to efficiently compute derivatives for aerodynamic shape optimization. It can model transonic effects, so shocks. It also can model turbulence with the turbulence model, but it cannot model the boundary layer transitioning from laminar to turbulent. The second flow solver we use is called complex foil. It's a complexified version of the XFOIL source code, so all the models are the same as XFOIL. By complexifying it, we can use the complex step method to get exact derivatives for optimization. The complex step method is kind of like finite differences where you step instead of in the real direction in the imaginary direction. It sounds kind of crazy, but it works really well. Complex foil, as XFOIL can, it can model boundary layer transition from laminar to turbulent. It also has a compressible correction, but it can't go beyond local flow speeds of Mach 1. This means it can't model shocks or other important transonic effects. Now I'll walk you through the framework we use to do this aerodynamic shape optimization. It's all based on Mach Aero, which is a collection of open source tools for aerodynamic design optimization. The first tool is PyOpt Sparse, which wraps a bunch of high performance optimizers that we can use to drive the optimization. In this case, the underlying optimizer we use is SNOPT. PyOpt Sparse will pass updated design variables to the geometric parameterization. In this case, we use PyGeo. 
what it's responsible for is taking those design variables and converting them to some change to the surface coordinates of the airfoil. We'll also have some geometric constraints, so PyGeo is also responsible for taking those surface coordinates and computing the geometric constraints for the optimization. The CFD solver requires a volume mesh, so we need to take those surface coordinates and somehow warp the volume mesh to fit the new shape. We do that using ID warp. Finally, the updated volume mesh is passed to the CFD solver, ADFlow, which computes the aerodynamic functions for optimization. The complex foil framework looks very similar, except because complex foil and X foil use only surface coordinates, there's no volume mesh or volume mesh warping involved. So this removes ID warp from the framework. We use the same optimization problem throughout all of this work. Because the goal is to gain the most intuition possible, we use a relatively simple optimization problem where we minimize the drag of the airfoil at a single target lift coefficient. We parameterize the airfoil shape with CST coefficients that work something like this. You start with a class shape, in this case a really thick airfoil, and then you scale the upper and lower surfaces independently with a scaling factor. That scaling factor is shown in the top plot as that thicker blue line and in the bottom plot as the thick blue line. That scale factor is the sum of Bernstein polynomials. So in this case, they're the lighter lines in the upper and lower plots. Each polynomial is weighted by a scalar value. And by changing that value, we can change the shape of the airfoil. One thing to note here is look at what happens when we change the polynomial associated with the leading edge of the airfoil. When we change that value, we end up with something looking kind of like a kink at the leading edge, a C2 discontinuity. And that's associated with the last constraint in the optimization problem that I'll show on the next slide. So for the geometric constraints, we enforce an area that's at least 85% of the initial NACA 0012 geometry. We enforce a similar constraint for the leading edge radius, which maintains adequate off-design performance. We also add a thickness constraint that keeps the thickness over 25% of the initial geometry. This is particularly important near the trailing edge where the optimizer really likes to thin out the design. And lastly, we enforce that the two first CST coefficients are the same to avoid that kink I showed on the last slide. Now we'll discuss the results. Keep in mind in particular how using different analysis methods, even with the exact same optimization problem, same flight conditions, ends up with two totally different designs. First, let me introduce you to our visualization, which uses a slightly nuanced approach to try to show flow features around the airfoil. We start off with the shape of the airfoil, and around that add regions to show the pressure coefficient. The blue regions are associated with negative pressure coefficient, or suction. The red regions are positive pressure coefficient. Along the surface of the airfoil, we plot the skin friction coefficient, this allows us to see what's going on with the boundary layer. When the skin friction coefficient increases drastically in a small location, we know that's associated with the boundary layer transitioning. When it goes negative, in this case shown in blue, that's separation because it's flow reversal, which results in a negative skin friction coefficient. We want to see how the designs optimized in 80 flow and complex foil differ at a range of flight conditions. In particular, we want to see how the boundary layer modeling affects the optimized design, and we also want to see how transonic effects change the shape. We do that using two sweeps. We do one sweep in Reynolds number at an incompressible Mach number to see how boundary layer transitioning affects the design. We also do a Mach number sweep at a moderate Reynolds number to investigate how shocks affect the design. But for analyzing the result, we'll have two different analysis tools with two different results. How do we know which one to trust? In the perfect case, we would have some sort of experimental result, or if we had the computational resources available, maybe a DNS result. But in this case, all we have is the two tools that we're using. So we're going to assume one of the tools is the true tool. And for the Reynolds number case, we'll treat XFO as that true tool, because it includes detailed modeling of the boundary layer and transition. For the mock sweep, 80 flow is the one that can model shocks and transonic effects, so we'll use 80 flow as the ground truth for the mock sweep. So let's start with the Reynolds number sweep. We're going to look for three things in particular. 
At the lowest Reynolds number, we expect the boundary layer to be totally laminar, so we'll see how that, which differs from ADFLOW's fully turbulent model, changes the design. At moderate Reynolds numbers, we expect transition to play a dominant role in shaping the airfoil, and at the highest Mach numbers, we expect there to be a point where the boundary layer transition moves so close to the leading edge that ADFLOW and XFOIL end up with similar results. Let's first take a look at a single optimization in the two solvers to see the difference in behavior between the two. ADFLOW, the RAND solver, smooths out the pressure distribution and makes a thin airfoil. XFOIL actually does something very different. It actually adds thickness to the airfoil and moves the max T over C further aft. This allows for a more favorable pressure gradient for the first part of the airfoil, which delays transition. This reduces the viscous drag. If we analyze the result from the AD flow optimization in XFOIL, we can see that the transition location is much further forward on that airfoil compared to the one optimized with XFOIL. Now let's take a qualitative look at the airfoils optimized at a range of Reynolds numbers. In the first row, we show the airfoils optimized in XFOIL. In the second row, they're optimized in the RAND solver, AD flow. And in the final row, we do something a little bit different. We force XFOIL to transition at the leading edge. So this effectively removes the transition modeling from XFOIL, but keeps all the other models there. At the lowest Reynolds numbers, the shapes look qualitatively pretty similar, but we can see big differences going on with what's happening in the boundary layers. AD flow and turbulent XFOIL are optimizing assuming a turbulent boundary layer, which can resist adverse pressure gradients for longer than a laminar one. XFOIL, on the other hand, knows it's a laminar boundary layer, so it can account for the separation that will occur. AD flow and turbulent XFOIL can't, so they end up with some separation on the upper and lower surfaces. At the moderate Reynolds numbers, we see a very big difference between the design optimized in XFOIL and the designs from AD flow and turbulent XFOIL. It uses a much larger thickness to delay transition, whereas the ones in AD flow and turbulent XFOIL have transition occur much further forward. At the highest Reynolds numbers, we see something we actually didn't expect. The XFOIL design ends up with a really thick airfoil that's still able to delay transition. On the other hand, the designs optimized in AD flow and turbulent XFOIL have transition locations that are almost at the leading edge. This really huge thickness in the XFOIL design might not occur if we add a moment constraint or if we add a multi-point design problem. However, for our problem, we're seeing transition play a role in the design to a higher Reynolds number than we expect. Let's now look at the actual numerical drag values found by taking the optimized designs and analyzing them in XFOIL. There's a surprisingly constant difference between the drag coefficients from the AD flow design and XFOIL design across the range of Reynolds numbers. At the lowest one, this is because XFOIL can account for the laminar boundary layer, which separates more easily than a turbulent one. At the moderate Reynolds number, it can use the transition information to delay transition and reduce the viscous drag. And this is actually true through the highest Reynolds numbers. If we add in the turbulent XFOIL design, it lies almost entirely on top of the AD flow optimized drag coefficient. The only difference in the model between turbulent XFOIL and XFOIL is the transition modeling. So this is showing that transition is really the dominant effect driving the difference in this drag. We do see some convergence in the drag at the highest Reynolds numbers, but I'm not sure when you'd have a subsonic airfoil at a Reynolds number over 100 million, maybe a really fast blimp or something. Next, we'll do the same optimization problem swept over a range of Mach numbers. And the question we're trying to answer here is when does modeling shocks become important? Again, we'll optimize in both AD flow and XFOIL, and then here the ground truth is AD flow, so we'll analyze the designs there. We expect that AD flow will be able to use the information about shocks to almost entirely reduce them and keep a relatively constant drag coefficient across the Mach number range. XFOIL, on the other hand, can't model these shocks and we expect a pretty big drag rise at some point in the transonic regime. If we look at the shapes alone, we can see that the shape from XFOIL stays relatively constant, especially compared to AD flow, where we can see by Mach 0.8, it's a very supercritical looking shape. We get a very flat upper surface and some camber toward the trailing edge. Now let's look at what AD flow tells us is happening around each of these optimized airfoils. 
Look at the one optimized in XFOIL at the highest Mach number. You might even call that shocking. There's a huge shock and then a bunch of shock induced separation downstream of that on the upper surface. On the other hand, the airfoil optimized in 80 flow has almost entirely reduced the shock. When we look at the actual drag coefficient as analyzed by 80 flow, we can see that the airfoil is optimized in 80 flow maintain almost a constant drag coefficient across the entire Mach number range. Based on the y axis here and where I've put the airfoils, you can probably guess what's coming next. The designs optimize an XFOIL, which can't model the shocks from these transonic effects, experience a huge drag rise after about Mach 0.65. So how do you use this information to improve your aerodynamic shape optimizations? We found that modeling transition affects the airfoil design to a higher Reynolds number than you might have expected. As we did expect, shocks dictated almost entirely the transonic airfoil design. But more broadly, Pick your analysis tools carefully. If they don't model all the important physics, the optimizer may be driven to a design that doesn't account for some really important factors. To be able to see how the physics that aren't modeled change before and after optimization, these post-optimality studies where you take the optimized design and run it in a different analysis tool are very useful. One note before you go out and use complex foil. The transition model from XFOIL results in local minima. This plot here shows two local minima and a slice of the objective function between it. You can see every time the transition location moves over a panel, you get one of these dips. This leaves the door open for a potentially new tool, uses the same models as XFOIL, but designed for gradient-based optimization. So what did we show here? We started off by presenting complex foil, which is a version of XFOIL modified for gradient-based optimization. By comparing airfoil optimizations in complex foil and 80 flow, our RANS tool, we found that including transition drastically changes the design for a wider range of Reynolds numbers than we might have expected. Finally, we showed how you can use post-optimality studies to analyze how the missing physics change from before and after optimization. Let me point you to two more papers from the same ICAST conference that show applications of MDO to multi-fidelity aerostructural and aeropropulsive design optimization. Finally, take a look at engineering design optimization by Martins and Ning if you're interested in learning more about the fundamental principles we use in all of these optimizations.